Our world is lost in unnecessary fear and hurt. Our systems seem scientifically engineered to make you small, powerless, and always waiting for the next great leader who will fix the problems around us. Worse, we're witnessing neighbor versus neighbor while warfare breaks out around our family tables. But you have access to a spirit, a strength that enlarges and empowers you. Even better, you don't need to wait for the next big movement. You can heal the world. It's time for governance by Grace. Welcome to Grace Archie with Jim Babka. Wow, have we got a song for today, Jim? <laughs> <laughs> the the new um how many how many plays right now? It's 12 million plays. Yeah, and growing. I mean, and by the growing. time people see this, it'll be more than that. So that represents a good chunk of America, although people are probably watching it more than once. But still, that's a good slice of us. Uh, let's just play this. It's Oliver Anthony, Rich Men, North of Richmond. I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay, so I can sit out here and waste my life away. Drag back home and drown my troubles away It's a damn shame What the world's gotten to For people like me People like you Wish I could just wake up And it not be true But it is Oh it is Living in the new world With an whole soul These rich men know Just miners on an island somewhere Lord, we got folks in the street Ain't got nothing to eat And the whole beast milking welfare God, if you're five foot three And you're 300 pounds Taxes ought not to pay For your bags of fun drowns Young men are putting themselves Six feet in the ground Cause all this damn country does Is keep on kicking them down Lord, it's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me, people like you. Wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is living in the new world with an old soul. These rich men know the rich men. Your dollar ain't shit, and it's tax to no hand. Calls the rich men, North of rich men. I've been selling my soul, working all day. Overtime hours for bullshit pay. Man, okay, Richmond, North of Richmond. So I, I hear this song, I realize it's about Washington, D.C. <laughs> you think? There's another Richmond, though, and Mr. Oliver totally missed that one. It's the one south of Richmond in what we might call Silicon Valley. And there's a lot of rich men there who were in even more control over his little life than I think he is aware of. Uh, not entirely. I mean, like he said, they want all your information. They want to know everything about you, what you do, what you like. Um, he's, he def definitely gave a nod to the surveillance state in this and talked about 
about that. They did have a deep control over life. Yeah, I I point is it's much bigger than government. Yeah. So so the song itself, you know, you're a music expert. A, a little bit of Woody Guthrie meets Hank Williams. What do you hear here? Yeah, it's a pretty simple song, but it's got the resonance that gets people on board with the message. And what 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 accounts for that resonance? I spoke to one person who did not like his voice at all, and then I saw comments online saying he sung with such emotion. Yeah, um, he's passionate. So it, it's a heartstring song. I mean, it's definitely speaking to a certain kind of person. And there are a lot of that kind of person out there right now. Uh, I don't want to comment on the musical nature of it all. There's because that tends to be isolating instead of uh, instead of accepting. So in this song, um, are, are, are you sure? Because I am. It's. I mean, I, I ask you this because you're musimorphic, right? And right. You can give a pl uh, a plug for your website right now Thank and you. your product. Musimorphic.com. Okay. Check it out. The quest is amazing. Music has an ability to heal, right? It has an ability to uh, to soothe or reach certain parts of us and yep. affect us in certain ways. And um, you know, I I do you remember the movie Hillbilly Elegy? Okay, okay. and it was a book, and 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 the, the author of it is now in the U.S. Senate, rep uh, one from Ohio. And and this is a book or a story that became a a, a major motion picture that spoke for a certain group of people at the time and pro and and a lot of people connected and said hey this is trump is identifying these people and he's gone out and spoke to them i mean he definitely is he he's he's got a uh a whistle that they can hear yeah i'm with you on that but i think it goes beyond trump okay i agree with that and i definitely don't want to get hung up on that yeah uh, so just on a music level you're looking at this how well, uh, this is one of those, uh, I'd call it an anthem. It's yes. a song for the little guy. You know, it's, we've been kicked to the curb here and we need to have a voice. And what Oliver Anthony's done is to give everyone who's, who feels that way something to identify with and, and a way to have a voice and maybe share in the complaint. And uh, music is powerful that, for that, right? Because it opens us up emotionally. So we, we resonate, you know, with the way he's, he's hollering at us, basically. And uh, I'm saying that in a musical sense. <laughs> I'm not saying that in an offensive sense. But I love the way that he busts through all the political correctness here and gets right to the heart of the thing. And this is how we really feel. And, and you don't need much music to make that happen, you know, Jim? He, he's got just enough music to give him a backdrop against which he can say what needs to be said here. Okay. Okay. I think that's a good place to start. Uh, honestly, I'm, I'm glad we were able to get your opinion there. And then, you know, other shameless plug, this show is brought to you by the zero aggression project, zero aggression project.org. So we've got our shameless plugs out of the way. I think that, that, if you're coming at this and trying to analyze this from a gray sarky, this, this song from a gray sarky angle, what is the grace aspect of this? I think that there is a temptation. We live in an era or a time where you first check to see which tribe the item's on, and then you know whether or not you're allowed to like the song or oh, you're sure. supposed to love the song. Yep. And what strikes me is that the very first person I heard about this song from was not was as anti-MAGA as you could be. And this person happened to be very libertarian and said, I feel like this speaks for me and the people I know. And immediately that was followed up by somebody else who was anti-MAGA, another libertarian who was in that conversation set and, and actually stopped in uh, at the, uh, he was gonna be at a flea market this past weekend. There was a huge crowd that showed up for this free concert that he was putting on. And he stopped by that hours before the concert was supposed to happen and shot some photos of the site before everybody was there. Neither one of these people are MAGA in, in the least. And in fact, I would even go so far as to say anti-MAGA um, in terms of their, their aesthetic. So I, something about this song cut right past all of that initially. Now it hasn't taken long for the media to get in on, on, on this whole thing. In fact, <laughs> I'm reminded of Frank Zappa who said, most rock journalism is people who can't write 
interviewing people who can't talk for people who can't read. <laughs> and and uh they're they are picking up like they they understood what the game is here right it's supposed mm -hmm. to be about the conflict machine and so right away it's about who's sharing this song on their social media platforms who's endorsing this song and who should be concerned and and who's offended by it so a lot of the coverage has already kind of started to divide in the red and blue and it's been decided by the media that this is definitely a red song I don't think that's completely accurate, but I, I heard it as a purple song too, to be honest. First time I heard it. Yeah. So my experience is, is I heard it the first time I felt, as you said, purple, it's kind of red and blue. I would say gold because I felt libertarian. Yep. There you go. The first verse was very libertarian to me. Oh yeah. And the yeah. fact I've been that he mixed my soul, certain... working all day, overtime hours. Um, yeah. Do, do the, the verse, the first verse again, it, it goes how? Yeah, I've been selling my soul, working all day, overtime hours for bullshit pay, so I can sit out here and waste my life away, drag back home and drown my troubles away. It's a damn shame what the world's gotten to for people like me and people like you. I wish I could just wake up and it not be true, but it is. Oh, it is. So at that point in time, I'm thinking, well, this is pretty good. Uh, this, is an, this, is a, this is almost a folk anthem, although it's sung in a loud country blues kind of way. Um, but the, the the lyrics are are folksy, are folk type songs, right? You can yeah, imagine yeah, a Woody Guthrie or a Bob Dylan kind of channeling through there. And I, I'm not I'm not doing this for comparison, folks. So don't get all offended because like, oh, he's no Bob Dylan, right? Sometimes Bob Dylan was no Bob Dylan. Leave it alone. But um, there was there was something kind of happening there in that verse now he gets into some other stuff that has more of a partisan flavor into it and there's one in part of that in particular i want to look at but this has been a summer in entertainment of like where of, of preferring certain art due to your politics yes yes so uh on the movie front oppenheimer and 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 even more so barbie are very much progressive uh theater productions right they, yeah. they came out and said something that was very much in those veins now i've had the opportunity to see both movies enjoyed both movies I, barbie less i mean only marginally so uh, i had problems with that i thought i had some good things i think every man should see the movie uh the barbie movie i'm but uh ken made me gag uh he was horrible as uh, the, the this did this movie does not fails to notice the, the, the complete human condition. It, it does focus on the female condition. As, and, and I think in a way that is constructive and valuable for people to, to consume. Oppenheimer is simultaneously pro-war and pro-communism. Um, and I, I thought it was a spectacular movie. I was very, it's a long movie. Uh, it's really long, but it's very well done. And I enjoyed that movie. But, you know, these were movies that were kind of telling very much telling stories of the political left. And then on the right, we had Jason Aldean, who got knocked off the top of the charts by um, Oliver, by Anthony. Oliver Anthony here. Yep. Right. Yep. He was number one on the charts with it, with his song. Try that in a small town. Yep. Slightly offensive song, too. Yeah. And well, I would say even maybe a little more. I mean, like the, 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 that was not an anthem song. I mean, maybe he wanted it to be. But that song. That song was actually kind of scapegoating and advocating violence. And I actually think it was a, a, a right-wing country version of a rap song. Like, there's a lot of rap songs that are full of violence in them. And I thought that song was an implied violence. Um, now, as a form of art, it should be out there. As a form of expression, it should be out there. It should be part of the conversation, just like every rap song is. I mean, I'm not, censorship is wrong, but I didn't find the message to be inclusive, loving, affirming. I do think there's a degree to which Oliver Anthony is trying to reach out and express the voice of other people. Like, this is what I went through. And my understanding is it is something that he's gone through to some degree. He apparently dealt with chemical addiction at one point and, and, and found the savior and said, you know, I want to go back. And now this song, which comes from a deep part in him. I mean, this is what a lot of people don't understand. When comedians get up, there's darkness in a lot of these people. When musicians get up, there's darkness in a lot of these people. Absolutely, yes. And they're dealing with the darkness. They put the darkness out in front of us. They make themselves vulnerable to us. And they share the darkness. 
Yeah, yeah. And it's that that connection that we get because we recognize the darkness they're in. And so we recognize the darkness that that he was in. It, without severe pain, he couldn't have probably written this song. There's a couple lines I'm going to quibble with, or would like to, if we have time, quibble with here. But but if we just look at it as a whole piece of work, this really is, he's, the reason the passion is coming through his voice isn't just a fact. He's not putting on a show. Like, he feels that all the way down to his balls. Does that make sense? Yeah, you can, you know, it's our pain that unites us. And there is nothing like this kind of pain to create that bridge where nothing else can. Okay, so I think there's two camps here that, that, that and I, I'm, I'm, I've got problems with both of them. Uh, there are those who are moved by the truth of it. And they're saying this is such a wonderful song. And they are attempting to incorporate it and identify it with their political identity. Right, right. And then the, uh, there's another side that says half, we just found out now that, you know, 12 million people and counting are deplorables. They're identifying themselves by listening to this song, right? Like they are, um, this gets this gets to something really fundamental that we're going to talk about in an upcoming episode, which is why people identify with Trump. Like you, this is the felt real experience of people. And if you start reading the comments on YouTube, which I did over the weekend, and I was stunned by what was there and just the consistent pattern of it. I want to share one with you. This one, I could have yeah, picked it, any number of them. But this one, I thought, really encapsulated a lot. I'm a 42-year-old truck driver and been working 70 hours a week plus side work for over seven years straight. And this hit home. I take responsibility for not living a financially perfect life. But pair that with a divorce and a family tragedy. And I feel buried, and no matter how much I grind and stay positive, I see no light at the end of the tunnel. Politicians are so out of touch with who they represent. It's gotten so much harder to stay afloat these past few years. I do not need or want any handouts. But stop making it so damn hard for hardworking Americans to get ahead or climb out of struggles no matter how they got there. And I thought, man, that really totally kind of encapsulates a great deal of what's happening uh, in this song. And and you go, Bill, you go down the, the Facebook comments. I'm sorry, the YouTube comments. You just keep going down, down, down. You're going to keep reading stuff just like this. But Jim, but Jim, the government represents us. The government is who we elect. We are the ultimately responsible parties for allowing this to happen. Okay, I got two things I want to say to that. First, and the, the first part's easy and short. No, it doesn't. Um, the game has been rigged for a considerable amount of time. And we dealt with the campaign finance rigging in a previous episode that we'll put down in the show notes. Uh, there is uh, there is the gerrymander, which is an incumbent rig, so that the con your congressman picked you rather than you picked your congressman. There are uh, a whole host of institutional things that are, are erected in place to keep the edifice of this system up and elevated. And it's gotten, and it has the gun at the end of the day that it can use. There is also considerable evidence for a deep state behind and under and uh, underneath all of this, uh, where we can see that even the president of the United States has very little power. We're going to get into that topic a lot more detail in the fall. And, and I, uh, let's not leave aside the fact that they inflate the currency with a board of people that was not, not chosen in any way, day, shape, or form democratically. Now, they are not that, even technically part of the government. That resonates for me. We did that inflation episode. And, yes. Uh, and we have a lot more to say about that as the year wears on as well. And, and that is not a small factor. That is crushing. That is absolutely crushing. And it is the policy of your government, ladies and gentlemen. They believe this with all their heart that they have to inflate by one to 2% a year. Inflation is, is counterfeiting. It amounts to theft. It diminishes your purchasing power. If it seems like you're having to work harder and harder to achieve the same thing just to keep up, this is a big, big part of the factor. Wages haven't increased, real, real wages haven't increased since what, 72? 
Yeah. And, you know, uh, this kind of funny because a lot of people look at this time and they say, what happened at this moment in U.S. history? Because there's several economic indicators that suddenly don't work the way they did previously. And there's a number of different explanations for this. But the one I favor is the fact that we went off the gold standard at that moment. Because the government was already so inflating so much that the gold standard was showing what a lie the dollar was. And we have increasingly detached from reality. Your dollar bills in your pocket are merely accounting units, or as I like to say, uh, Federal Reserve accounting unit, the dollar, fraud. It's a fraud. And we measure growth in dollars, not in, out, in, in, in spe not specifically in wealth, not in your improved quality of life, not in your improved recreation time, not in your improved choice to go pursue your art or your passion. We measure it not in your ability to consume more, we represent we we uh, which would be wealth. We we do it based on growth, and this is this puts all Americans on a hamster wheel, except for the people at the very very top who are able to live off of their money. The rich, but the rest of us who have jobs. Yep. Right. And there are a group of people in Washington. You know, you come from California. Your governor helped illustrate a very very important point during the pandemic. He sat down in a restaurant with a group of unmasked people inside the restaurant, some of whom were top public health officials, and had a meal and conversation in an exclusive restaurant that most Americans cannot afford to go to, or if they did, they'd have to save up to do it. And he went there and he dined and then said, and this was during the midst of the pandemic when they're supposed to be masking and everybody's supposed to be eating outdoors and yada, yada. Yep. Yep. This state, your state was a terror on this subject. And then denied it when he got confronted about it. Then there was visual evidence that he was lying about it and made up another story. And that's what led to his recall. And unfortunately, it didn't result in any change of governance there. In fact, it doesn't seem to have impaired his political career hardly at all. At all. Yeah. Which is bizarre. Yeah. Okay. That he could just create such a brazen lie. So where does that brazen lie come from? You know, he was not the only politician that made that kind of mistake during the course of the pandemic. Showed True. obvious hypocrisy. Yes. And he was not the only politician that ultimately was put in a position where he had to apologize. But what people think goes on is that when he issues that apology, he's apologizing to the people. Oh, he's really contrite. He said he was sorry. Right? He didn't mean to do it. It was a misjudgment on his part. That's not what happened. The people he's actually apologizing to, ladies and gentlemen, are the people that he moves money for. Because what a politician's job these days largely is, is to move money. They raise money by moving money. They raise a little money for their campaign by moving vastly larger amounts of your money to their favored interests. Exactly. And this is one of the things that's frankly being addressed here. Explicitly calling these the rich men north of Richmond. The purpose of saying that out loud was to say there are a group of people who are operating in 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 a uh, in a grift, a major grift that is robbing you and me, and that's that's the, that's the core of that first verse. And I think it's the reason that this thing rockets right off the, the the pad. Like you could start to quibble about some of the lyrics that come later, but this song rockets off the pad on that first verse, and the comments that tend to flow below come off of that first verse. Yeah, that's that's the point. Yes. So so you've dealt with the fact that government doesn't represent us and you had one other point to make about that. The if you want the voters to start to move, you've got to give them the means to do it. Um they have to have ways to coalesce. There's moments like this. There's usually not one. It has to be a series of things that galvanize people over time. Thomas Jefferson says right in the Declaration of Independence that we are we are prone to suffer a long train of abuses before we basically react. And this, this song, amongst other mom flash moments, is a moment of reaction to that. It's a moment of galvanization. I don't know how far or how long it carries. Yet, time will tell us that. But it could become the anthem of a new movement, and it could be an anthem of a movement that's already started that's going to begin to expand. It could be a number of different things that happen here. But these points have to occur because most people spend most of the time feeling powerless 
and they only have one vote that can't change anything anyway. And so they wait for a moment like this, but maybe this moment becomes the moment that it happens. And so I would argue, Bill, they need people because there's because we feel so overwhelmed need moments that unite them like this. I, I you know, I remember I go I flash back all the way to the very first time you and I appeared in front of a camera and with microphones. And and you and John Krotek, who was co-interviewing me at the time, were interested in who are the leaders that that who are the outliers that become the uh, that are truly authentic that become the leaders and i don't want to go so far as to label oliver anthony a leader i don't think that's appropriate honestly i don't think uh, he was not his role make, it's not his role he's like a but prophet he, right but he provides yeah he provides an anthem yes for uh for a movement of people and maybe this is maybe that's what happens here because we do have Richmond North of Richmond. That is a fact. It's just a gospel fact. And the divide in this country is not between uh, left and right. It's it, And it's not even between the haves and the have-nots. A lot of people, that gets closer to what it is. It really does. But it ain't that either. There's lots of haves that aren't, aren't out screwing you. They're out providing good products and services. And they've been rewarded for doing that. That's how the market works. But there are people who are feeding at the trough who do things like shut down their competition, make special rules, get special uh, perks, get contracts on the side, have governments topple other governments if necessary so that they can keep doing business. And this has been going on since the post-World War II period. You know, <laughs> so I'm gonna, we've been, we've been maybe we, in some ways we've been waiting for Oliver Anthony since, since the day that uh, they dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Because in 1947, we completely rearranged the national security state. And we said, okay, it's time for us to go unleash America on the entire world. We're going to America the hell out of everybody. And, and uh, there's a lot of stuff that's been done in your name. And, and not just in your name, but with you co-signing the note, because the debt is massive. We have a military that takes up over 3% of our GDP when there is isn't another country on the planet that's spending even two and most spending less than one. And you are the world's policeman. You pay for all of that and you vote for it and support it. And by the way, if you voted for Trump, he, 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 he constantly expanded by more than was requested the amount of defense spending. But this president has, you know, tried stop one war, realized how much trouble he got in with the establishment, turn around and start another one of that was worse in some ways, for our future security. And they've been endangering us gradually more and more all along. Rich men and rich men needed to make sure that those defense contracts kept right on moving. I want to address a, a point that you touched on about who this song is for. And I, I want to put it in the context of the mainstream media's eagerness to pan this as a right-wing anthem. Because generally speaking, when the media does something that big, that fast, there's a preference that they are not acknowledging. And if there's, a, if there's any message that splits the middle, it's this message. Okay. So there's two things to be said about that too. At first, there is a political realignment occurring in this country and you'd have yes. to be blind not to see it. I'm old enough. I got gray hairs on my head. Okay. And you can, and I can tell you that when I was a kid, the democratic party was the party of the little guy, the party of the blue collar, the party of, um, uh, that looked out for people that, you know, needed a little bit of help, took care of the middle class. And the Republicans were the elite party. They were the party of the wealthy. They were the party for the business owners. And there has been a role reversal. And that thing, and it has changed fast. It is fast how, how epically things have changed. And the Democratic Party has a populist wing in it, uh, led by Bernie Sanders, even though he's not technically a Democrat. Um, but he and his ilk, and there's others of, of his ilk in the Congress that cannot get anywhere inside the Democratic Party because the Democratic Party is an anti-democratic institution. And you say, Jim, how is that possible? Well, they have this thing called superdelegates, 
and they have a very rigged process for ensuring who's going to get their party nomination and be their national spokesperson and set the tone for the party. And they have made sure that no one can get past it, which is why they got stuck with a candidate who was literally the worst candidate of all time in Hillary Clinton. She was completely unqualified for the job. Um, and, and, and then they follow that up with a guy that doesn't know his, his name some days. This is how this happens because there's no competition over there and they've shut down all debates on that side now. Okay. Because they have this firewall, they can guarantee that they don't even have to put the guy in a debate. They can just send him right out to the general election. And this is why there's no coverage of Robert F. Kennedy because the media is full on aware of this. Just, just to be clear. Okay. This is why other people are not getting in the race. Although Gavin Newsom probably will be in the race before this is all over. Now, that's a, a a bend that they all have, but to focus in on that is to focus to is is to focus on the smaller part. The bigger bend is that these people are attached to an establishment that is in lockstep in in not in, and and does not understand or appreciate flyover country. They look down their nose at the very people that would appear in a story like Hillbilly Elegy, who, by the way, just want to be left alone in a lot of ways. They look at those people and they sneer. And, and again, we're going to address this in, in an upcoming episode about why Donald Trump's appeal is so strong. I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself, but there is an establishment ethos running through the regime media. And to put a cap on all of this, you can't, you can't miss the point that the conflict machine is in action here, right? So in order to keep us from recognizing that this, the establishment versus the rest of us, and it's a very small number of them and a lot of us, they will do things to divide us and pit each other at each other's throats. And the one failing in Oliver Anthony's song is he manages to fall in this trap after the first verse is over. He does find a way to do that. And we are not each other's enemies, right? Republicans and Democrats are not each other's enemies. They've been taught and conditioned to think so. And, and the regime media as a part of that, as part of the machinery and fuel of the conflict machine, the political industrial complex, a better name for our politics is conflict machine. Okay. With politics is an anemic flat word. It's the conflict machine. They want to draw everybody in to fight each other so that we don't see their role in, in the screwing that's going on. We can scapegoat and blame one another. And as long as we're divided, there's their, their game keeps rolling. There is a divisiveness to this song, but it's not as, um, it's not as vituperative as a lot of hip hop. No, no, but but I you know I I want to focus in on the one place where I think this occurs. Could we? It's it's the welfare stuff. Yes, yes. Okay, so the myth of the fat welfare recipient. It is a myth. Okay, now I understand why people believe it. I, for the same reason, I understand why somebody believes the Earth is flat. Right. You can look out your front door and go, "Gee, the Earth looks pretty flat." Okay, and it makes sense. There's an intuitive sense to it. That if someone is not working, they're not getting the necessary movement and exercise they need to get to, they're kind of lazy, and that's being fed or fueled by welfare. Um, factually speaking, there is data to support the notion. Don't know whether it's true or not. You can manipulate data a lot of ways, but there actually is real data to support the notion that food stamps actually do improve obesity outcomes. They, they, obesity actually goes down. Yeah, you eat more healthy when you can afford better food. Exactly. OK, so so that the problem here is not for even for Mr. Anthony or any of his followers is not that there's somebody who's five foot three and 300 pounds. Who is able to get their welfare check that way? It's wrong to suggest that. However. There is this degree to which people believe that people who hold some of these views and we've already touched on this are rubes who don't know what's good for anyone, including themselves. They're too stupid. And that's actually not true. And I, it, it's, it's interesting because I've got a lot of friends on the right, including Trump supporters that I've talked to over the years. And I realize that they speak in kind of a coded symbolic language where things are reduced to bumper stickers. Now, I, I don't have as many friends on the left where I've been able to detect this pattern. So I don't know if this is a method of communication that goes on in the same exact way over there, but I've been easily able to spot it, having grown up in a, in a conservative Republican household and now being out in the world and having several of these friends, I've been able to spot it. So things 
they're not concerned with the precision of statements. The statement itself carries a certain weight. So if you're more hyper-literalist, this drives you crazy because there's factual inaccuracy to the statement, but the color of the statement has nuances and layers of meanings that go much further. So let me pa unpack what I'm talking about here, specifically with wealth there. So first, the people who are um, listening and agreeing with Oliver Anthony here don't want welfare. I mean, they can't be, I and mean, the quote I just read to you a few minutes ago, they can't be more explicit and clear about this. They don't want welfare. They want to work. And, and the fact that they, they view, first off, they view welfare being given out, money being taken from them to give to others as being part of the problem. They like to keep that money too. So whatever money they're giving away, like I need that money. I'm struggling. I shouldn't have to give out any more. And, and they conceive of that as part of their problem. But it goes further than that. They actually view, Bill, their work as virtue. It's part of their identity. So they'll call themselves a blue collar person, or they'll call themselves the little guy, or they'll talk about how, you know, they, they, uh, they have uh, country values, right? I get these that. are, yeah. yeah, these are all identity things. And part of that is their work, right? I went down into the mines and got cancer, but at least I provided for my family. Yep. I went to work and I got injured at the job uh, running some kind of heavy machinery, but at least I paid my bills, right? Being yep. a good person at its base involves work, and they, they actually extol work as a virtue. Additionally, there's another thing that could be said, and that is that they are sophisticated enough, contrary to their critics, to know that the system is permanent and not a temporary help up. And they're yep. really bothered by that. Yep. Because if you were to actually ask 90% of them who would have who resonate with this line, and I mean this, go ask. 90% of them that resonate with that line in the song and agree with it are going to tell you flat out, well, the problem is it's permanent. Like if you said, we're only going to do this for a short time to help someone get back in the game, they'd be like, go for it, right? We all have times when we're down, kicked and beaten, go for it. That's not what happened here. And, and uh, I don't know if you could read the lines that went there. Just reread those, those specific lines back to me. Is that the five foot three line? Yeah, I think that's where it begins. Uh, yes. Well, God, if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bags of fudge rounds. Young men are putting themselves six feet in the ground because all this damn country does is keep on kicking them down. There you go. That's all you need right there. Okay. The line itself, the, those lines, the way they're put together, they're structured in an ironic fashion. And here's the irony. The previous line, the first line, is, is, is there's an, the line is talking about the fact that there's too little to eat for some people. Yeah, we, we got folks in the street, ain't nothing to eat, and the beast milk and welfare. Okay, right. Okay, yeah, we should have had that line in there too. So uh, do that all again so that we can get that right exactly okay, right. Okay, so that's just a little bit from the, the verse right before it. Yep. Lord, we got folks in the street, ain't got nothing to eat, and the obese, milk and welfare. Well, God, if you're five foot three and you're 300 pounds, taxes ought not to pay for your bags of fudge rounds. Young men are putting themselves six feet in the ground because all this damn country does is keep on kicking them down. So the, the, the first part about the people that can't eat, is, it, it, we're having little nothing to eat. And, and then there's a lament that's followed up where people are getting fed. And what is the difference between those two people? Some some people gave by being veterans, right? And we recognize there's a recognition. It's a widespread recognition amongst the exact same class of people that the veteran didn't get taken care of. Yep. He got sent off to fight some war, do whatever. He got scarred and damaged by it, came back home. And the services that needed to be there to support and help him weren't, despite the fact that he gave. But there's another group of people who get permanent support who haven't given, and I go to work every day to help pay for them. And yep. so if you're going to give him a choice between providing some welfare or helping the veteran, like if that's his choice, he's going to pick the veteran a hundred times out of a hundred. Right. Yeah. But he can't help noticing he ain't in the slice. Like this is yep. money I go earn. I'm struggling. Why isn't, why can't I keep mine? Yeah. So there's, you know, I watched somebody and I'm not going to say who it was. I watched somebody in one of the reaction videos talk about how, well, you know, these are the same people that want tax cuts, uh, implying that they're too stupid to know what they 
that you know they they need government help too. No, that this is the whole point. They want to work. They don't want the government help, yes. and they want that work to add up to something. And yes. so stop stealing. And he explicitly says, stop devaluing my dollar because he said your dollar ain't. <laughs> there is a picture right as I'm doing the show right now on Twitter where he autographed somebody's dollar bill and he wrote on the left, ain't worth shit. Like he wants people to understand this is part of what how they're being robbed. And to the degree that that message manages to get out there, go with God, Oliver Anthony, go with God. I love that the media is missing the intelligence in these lyrics. I love that. And I think you've just identified it in a way that really resonates. Okay. So what did we do here today? Can I tell you? Yes. We, we did an, an exercise of grace. We just invited Oliver Anthony up onto the porch yeah. for some lemonade. Yep. And I say this to say, I don't completely agree with Oliver. Like we just expressed some disagreements on a couple of points and I don't completely agree with every song that's, that, that comes out, but somebody's felt expression is there. And the reason, one of the reasons that a song may become a hit often has to do with what people are feeling inside that song, what, what it represented for them. It expressed something inside them in words, in, in music. And it did so in a way, because this is what music does, right, Bill? It, it, it brings people together. And so they come around to this common theme. Yep. So what is being expressed here? If we're going to get down to brass tacks, it's a lack of human respect. You know, the main thing I want to say about this song, and if you take away nothing else from this episode, it's a damn shame that this song has touched so many people. What I mean by that is that Violence and theft has been used have been used against them. I see what you're and saying. And it's diminished yeah. their happiness, harmony, and prosperity. This is yep. a violation of the natural principle of human respect. What the rich men in Richmond do is they violate human respect consistently and always. And we're starting to understand, we're starting, we've been intuitively feeling, but not able to put our finger on for a long time as a people, not me personally, but as a people the source of our angst, the source of our difficulties. Why maybe we can't get ahead. And then Oliver Anthony comes out and he says it. And people resonate because of, you're right. There's a lack of human respect right now. And they want to, and, and maybe we could do something to restore that. Now, a lot of people go off and do different things with this message. I'm, I'm not endorsing it for that very reason. Like, I have no idea what happens next with this message. And nine out of the 10 things that are likely to happen, I'm scared the heck out of me. But if people do wake up to the fact, the real problem is what goes on in that city north of Richmond, that money bags are being changed in that temple. And you're not in on the transaction. It's your money they're, they're exchanging. If you get in on that secret, then I think Oliver Anthony has done us a solid service. <laughs>